Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me and the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to stay, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. Blessed be his name. Here I am before you, falling in love and seeking your truth, knowing that your perfect grace brought me to this place because of you i freely live my life to you oh god i give so i stand before you god i lift up my voice because you set me free so i shout out your name from the rooftops i proclaim that i am yours i am I lift up my hands for all to see You're the only one Who brings me to my knees To share this love across the earth The beauty of your holy worth So I kneel before you, God I lift up my hands cause you set me free So I shout out your name From the rooftops I proclaim I am yours, I am yours, all that I am, I place into your loving hands, that I am yours, I am yours, here I am, I stand with arms wide open to the one, the Son, the everlasting God, the everlasting God. God, the everlasting God. So I shout out your name from the rooftops I proclaim that I am yours. I am yours. All that I am, I place into your loving hands that I am yours. I am yours.
Indeed, you are great and awesome and holy and worthy of all praise, Father God. Lord, it's a joy to be in your house this morning. It's a joy to lift up your name, to sing worship and praise to you, Father God. Lord, we just pray, Lord Jesus, that all has been received by you, Lord God, in a grateful way that we are pleasing and honoring you by gathering together here this morning and lifting up your name, Father God. Lord, there are several that we remember this morning that we think about in prayer. Father, I lift up first to Pastor Brian to you this morning. Lord, would you minister to his body? Would you touch his flesh? Would you bring healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus? Lord, you can cleanse far better than any doctor or medicine or anybody else. Lord, you are the great physician and we, we pray this morning for complete and total healing in his body in the name of Jesus. Lord, we continue to pray for his mom and dad as well. Lord, would you touch them? Would you bring healing there? Lord, would you bring strength and would you renew their flesh, Father God? Lord, we continue to think of Candy and ask that you would minister to her. Continue to give her strength, Lord God. Her and Greg both bring them peace and encouragement today, Lord. Father, so many others dealing with so many different issues. Father, would you just reach across this audience and this live feed and just touch and minister to those that need healing in your name, Father God. Strengthen them, we pray. Lord, we thank you for the time that we're going to be able to read from your word this morning and pray, Lord, that it would just flow forward as you want it to as well. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would help us to mature in you, to grow closer, Father, and being the, the kids, the, the, <laughs> the disciples that you want us to be, Lord. Teach us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have no idea what a week it's been. Um, it's been a crazy week. The enemy is not happy about something. <laughs> and he is, uh, he is throwing all kinds of fiery darts. Amen. But we're standing against him. Amen. We're holding up our shields. And we're pressing through. And somebody last week said we got to do it all with gratitude. <laughs> so we're working on that part as well. Lord, again, we just come before you this morning and want to commit this part of our service to you. We're going to read from your word. We're going to spend time listening to what you have to say. Lord, let it pierce our hearts. Let it touch us and change us and, and just mature us more and more each and every time we hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I... Um, I got to first say that I, I started working on this message before several things played out as they did this week. So it, it's amazing how God takes you through things as you're even preparing them. Life has a way of bringing us some very unexpected moments. I'm sure any of us listening can testify to that. It might be an unexpected task at work, maybe an injury while playing a game, a, a sudden illness, or even tragedy. On the other side of that coin, it could be a very sweet surprise, a very unexpected gift, or an amazing miracle. Each day, things arise in our lives that we have neither planned for nor expected, yet they come our way nonetheless. I'm going to ask you this morning to imagine with me for just a moment, I'm going to pull on that part of your, your mind, imagination, imagine for just a moment this morning what it might have been like when the disciples were doing what they were supposed to do 
They were following instructions, doing what Jesus had, had directed them to do, and yet found themselves in the midst of a perilous situation. What might that have been like? Or think about Job for a minute. It would appear by everything we read and know and understand that Job was doing whatever it is he was called to do. He was being obedient. He was the servant. He was living correctly, if you will. And yet he had to walk through some incredibly tragic time in his life. When things in our lives shift off-center, when they get just a little bit out of whack, we start to go into panic mode. Our thoughts, our desires, our visions, they all shift to the event at hand, to what is going on around us. And sometimes we start to stumble and falter. Many times we think, that the absolute worst is going to come out of whatever it is that's happening at that moment. When these events arise in our lives, we often refer to them as storms in our lives, don't we? Today we're going to look at yet another miracle. One that sent the disciples into full-on panic mode because they were caught in a storm. This was a storm that arose even though they were obedient to Christ. See, they allowed their fear to control them and they allowed their faith to falter. Listen closely as we read through Scripture this morning. In fact, make sure you listen closely because there's a couple of subtle messages in this text that if we're not paying attention, we will miss them. Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 22. One day Jesus said to His disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. He being Jesus, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. Let me pause for just a second there. This was not an unusual event. The Sea of Galilee was kind of in a valley and, and storms would arise very, very quickly on the sea. It was not unusual. They were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey Him. Now that is a pretty incredible miracle that took place on that sea that day. And the most obvious lesson that all of us can easily draw from this particular miracle is God's control over all things. And that includes nature. See, God created more than just the trees and the fish and the land. He created, He spoke into existence the entire meteorological system that we try to understand today. It's His ozone. It's His atmosphere. The rain, the condensation, the evaporation, the fog, they are all under His direct command and control. Not some imaginary Mother Nature. Every bit of this world 
has been created by divine design. That's a very simple, plain lesson that we can learn from that text today. But let's look past that lesson onto a couple other messages that we need to grab onto in this Scripture. See, not every storm that we'll experience in life involves water or wind. Many other storms can arise in our lives as well. I stated earlier that we rightly categorize rough circumstances or difficult problems or issues in life as storms. And the words of this text can help us see our way through those non-water-related storms just as Jesus delivered His disciples through that particular storm. As men, as, excuse me, as mankind, we tend to attribute everything that we view as negative to Satan. As, as believers, that, that, that's what we do. Something negative or bad happens and, and we immediately blame Satan. And I'm not saying we're, we're wrong in that. I'm saying that's what we do. I want us to consider something though. As we learned and, and as we read through the book of Job in our lives, even Satan ultimately is subject to God. He has to have permission in order to do anything. Satan is under God's authority. Nothing happens in life. Nothing happens in nature. Nothing happens in this entire universe that God does not have foreknowledge or understanding of before it ever takes place. Even though we don't always understand it, even though what we see is negative, we have to know that it is being allowed by a sovereign God. If it was not, He would not be a sovereign God. It's a sovereign God that has control of all things. While we struggle to see beyond the immediate, God not only sees what's happening, He knows what's happening way ahead of time. And He knows what's going to come. He knows every detail of every situation from the very beginning to the very end. In this particular text that we just read this morning, the very first line of what we read gives the disciples a look forward to what is coming. There was a clue given to them in this negative situation that they overlooked. They missed it. How about us? Did we miss it when we read it this morning? Jesus said to them, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Jesus was giving His disciples instruction to follow and He was telling them what the outcome was going to be in that very first verse. They were going to the other side of the lake. They were not going to be dying in the middle of the lake. They were not going to be destroyed by their surroundings as they crossed over. They were going to the other side. Did the disciples hear that as a promise? Did they understand what He was saying? Do we pick up on those still, soft voices of direction that we're given? See, when God gives us direction, He often includes far more detail than we realize. He speaks and says stuff and reveals a lot of truth to us that we don't always pick up on. 
No, Jesus didn't outright warn them that getting to the other side meant fighting through some horrific storm that was going to come up upon them. But He told them they were getting to the other side. You have to wonder, had He given them all the detail, had He told them that this was what it was going to be like, if they knew the danger that awaited them, would they have responded the same way? Would they have been as readily obedient to do what He called them to do? If we know, when we know, detailed difficulty lies ahead, we react differently. We see things differently. I can imagine just about anybody listening here today or watching here today would be super excited if God told you that you personally were going to lead every member of your family to faith in Christ. That nobody would ever leave this earth without having a personal relationship with Jesus. That would excite us, would it not? I hope so. But what if at the same time He told you as part of that, you are going to suffer a great deal of physical pain. You are going to have to endure multiple surgery after surgery after surgery. You are going to have to spend months upon months isolated in a hospital bed. What would our reaction be then? How excited would we be at that moment? Would we see it the same way as we just saw it a second ago? We would react differently. We would respond differently. The choices we make, we would make differently if we knew all of that detail up front. See, this is where faith comes in. The very faith that Jesus was asking His disciples about. When we are given direction by God, He expects our obedience whether it makes sense to us or not. No matter what we might find ourselves in the midst of or not. See, He wants us to have the same faith that Abraham had. God told Abraham not just that he would have a son, but that through that son would come offspring too numerous to count. Genesis 15.5 He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count the stars. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. How then was that going to happen when God later said to Abraham, I want you to sacrifice the very son that I promised you? You know, we read through that account and we know the end of the story. We know that God stopped Abraham's hand and put a ram in the thickets and and Abraham was able to sacrifice that ram. But Abraham himself did not have that knowledge while following God's instructions. He was in the midst of the storm wondering how in the world is this going to work out? But he was still obedient. He knew that God had promised him uncountable descendants. And he also knew that God had asked him to sacrifice this the son through whom that promise would be fulfilled. What the disciples knew, whether they caught it or not, what the disciples knew was Jesus' promise to go to the other side of the lake even while facing the storm that came up very unexpectedly in their lives. What we know is God's Word, His written text to us, and all the promises throughout that Scripture. What we also know is any personal direction God has given us. Many of us sit here, many of us listen, and we have heard God tell us, do this, do that. I want you to be a part of this. I want you to go here. Those are all guidance and direction that we have gotten 
from God. And He has not necessarily given us every detail of how that's going to happen, but He's told us to go. It is our job to be faithful and obedient and to do what He has directed to do. Think about this. Do you think Jim Elliott and his wife and all of their uh, uh, friends would have gone and done what they did in Ecuador if they knew all the details of their adventure? And yet, through their lives, the Aka people were changed forever. And not just them. Countless others have been changed and inspired by what God did through their lives. We're not looking at this particular text today, but on the other side of the lake, when the disciples passed through that stormy sea and got to their destination, there was an incredible miracle going to occur there as well. A miracle that millennia of generations have learned from and stood by. That was where Jesus met the demon-possessed man at the tombs and changed His life forever. Even the town's life around them. So the disciples were so consumed with their immediate circumstances of this storm that they missed God's promise of getting to the other side. And they could have very easily missed what God was going to do with them next in that cemetery. How many times have we missed out on whatever because we have allowed the current circumstances to dictate our choices or our thoughts instead of following God's promised direction. Many of things have set, been said about faith. Many of little um, sayings have been developed about faith. One of them is this. Faith is not believing in spite of circumstances. Faith is obeying in spite of feelings and consequences. What feelings were present when Abraham led Isaac up that hill to be sacrificed? What foreseen or imagined circumstances might have caused him to withhold his obedience? Faith was credited to Abraham because in spite of all that he saw and felt and knew, He trusted God in what God said. He trusted in the midst of that storm. Another beautiful picture we can see in this particular account of the disciples with Jesus crossing Galilee is Jesus' presence with them in the midst of the storm. He very easily could have sent them across on their own, but He did not in this case. He was with them. You know, God did not ask Abraham to go it alone either. God was with him. Or does God ask us to fly solo? He's with us. When He calls, when He leads, when He gives instructions, He does it as a joint operation. We work together with Him through it all. He remains every step of the way with us. Whether it's a clear, straight, beautiful path or whether it's a stormy, raging, tossed, crazy path, He is with us through it all. Many times we have sung the song called Eye of the Storm. It's a beautiful song. I I love the message that it has to say. It's all about the fact that God is in the midst of the storm with us. That He, in fact, is our anchor. He is what holds us together and keeps us through the darkest of night. 
the disciples forgot that for a moment. The fear and the anxiety of their surroundings overtook them. And despite the fact that they could physically see their Savior with them in the boat, they failed to see their Savior right there with them in the boat. They lost sight of Him. They panicked. They assumed that He had forgotten them or in some way didn't care about them anymore. Those were the thoughts running through their minds as they panicked to wake Him up. Even though they had already made, even though Jesus had already made them the promise, they didn't pick up on it. They didn't stand firm on it. They went into fear mode. One more thing that we definitely need to pull away from this particular miracle. Be ready. Be ready. When God directs us to do something, it does not automatically mean that every step of it is going to be perfect and easy and clear and without hurdles or pitfalls. The odds are we're going to encounter obstacles along the way. We're going to encounter those difficult situations along the way. Think about Paul. Paul was told by God Himself that he would preach to all these different people. But along the way, Paul encountered hunger, prison, persecution, shipwrecks, on and on. He encountered all kinds of hurdles doing what he knew he was supposed to do. John John was used by God to write some incredible words. Words that we specifically cling to and hold tightly to today. He wrote the book of Revelation. All about Christ's second coming and and the rapture of the church. and, And we cling to those words dearly today. But John wrote them when he was banished to an island and sat in isolation. Not exactly a joyful, fun, exciting time, was it? One of the primary reasons it's so important for us to mature in Christ is so that we can learn to stand firm in our faith. No matter what happens around us. No matter what storms may come up. Jesus did an amazing miracle when He told the the wind and the waves to be still. See, under normal circumstances, when the wind dies down, the waves roll on for hours and hours. But in this case, everything was instantly calm. Instantly calm. When we learn to keep moving in our faith, the faith that we have been given in Jesus Christ, things have a way of being amazingly calm. Even in the midst of the storm. Even in the midst of the trouble. You see, we're not going to be free from trouble. There's not going to be a a void of of crisis in our lives. There will be issues to deal with. I, I can't stress that enough. Anybody that has told you that life is going to be perfect when you surrender to Christ lied to you. There are still storms that we have to deal with in our lives. But our faith in Christ gets us through those storms. And they give us a spiritual calm that we can press through as we stand on our faith in Christ. When we adhere to Jesus' direction and obey His leadings, He is sure to be with us, to walk with us, and we will experience calm in those storms. And I I think it's important that we pick up on that particular phrase right there. The calm in the storm. The storms don't always go away. But there is a calm in 
the storm. When we trust Christ, when we obey, when we move forward, when we stand on that faith that He has given us. And this was the the very question He was posing to His disciples. Where is your faith? Is your faith in the calm waters and the smooth seas and the clear skies? Is that where your faith is at? Or is your faith in the One who holds all of those in the palm of His hand? Where is our faith at? Is it in the doctors? Is it in this? Is it in that? Is it in something else? Or is it in the One who holds all things in the palm of His hand? Where is our faith? In His book, Calm in the Storm, How God Can Redeem a Crisis to Advance His Kingdom, Rod Remier gives a personal example of a calm that he felt in a storm in his life. Let me read just a a little bit to you. Jen and I were on a plane ride from Newark to Cozumel. We were looking forward to getting away for a few days. We were both quietly reading a book when we heard a frantic flight attendant screaming, Fire in the cockpit! There's a fire in the cockpit! Not the kind of thing that sets you at ease when you're 30,000 feet up in the air. The mood on the plane noticeably shifted as voices rose in disbelief. When she came running back down the aisle again yelling, Brace! 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 Some people started screaming. Other people were crying. One lady in front of me fainted and her husband was slapping her in the face trying to wake her up. Which, even in the panic, was a little bit funny to watch. I leaned over to Jen, kissed her gently on the cheek, and said, if we die, it's been a good life. And I love you. Then I went back to reading my book. The flight made an emergency landing in Tampa Bay. There were fire trucks and emergency vehicles all over the runway as we made our landing. As we landed, I checked my pulse. My pulse rate was at 60. Yet they took all the flight attendants off on the plane on gurneys. My calm was as real and sure as my home in heaven. Secure eternal roots help us to navigate a current crisis with a calm interior. In the midst of a raging storm on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus performed an incredible miracle for His disciples by calming that physical storm. At the same time, He reassured us that He will bring an unexplainable calm in the midst of the storm as long as our faith is in Him. Lord, I thank You for the calm that You bring in the midst of every single situation we face. Lord, whether we see stuff as good or bad, however we view what's happening around us, Lord, You are there to bring a peace and a calm that surpasses all understanding. There is nothing too difficult for us to walk through. There is nothing too difficult for You to take care of as we venture out and stand on the faith that You have given us. God, You will be with us. You will keep us and direct us and guide our every steps. You will never leave us or forsake us or abandon us in anything. All we have to do 
is remain faithful to You. God, help us to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are unexpected storms already starting to churn in our lives this week. Things we're not expecting. Things we really don't want to see happen. But storms nonetheless that are rising up. God, whatever comes against us this week, help us to plant our feet on solid ground. Help us to stand strong in Your Word. Help us to hold up that shield that You have given us and extinguish those fiery darts of the enemy. God, give us victory today. This week to come, as we walk through the calm in the storm. In Jesus' name, Amen.